Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment. Today we're looking at reproduction in vertebrates. As we get into the topic, it's important that we understand that reproduction is a basic characteristic of all living organisms. The ability to be able to reproduce is important for every species so that they can sustain their population. It's important that we understand the difference between what vertebrates are and invertebrates. Today our focus is on just how reproduction occurs in vertebrates. What are vertebrates? Remember that when we refer to vertebrates, we refer to organisms or individuals that have a skeleton, which has a skull, along with a spinal column. So clearly our focus today is on looking at how your vertebrates reproduce. Let's get into the concepts of the lesson, and then we'll unpack the details of reproduction in vertebrates. Well, in our lesson today, we're going to focus on what are the reproductive strategies that are necessary for organisms to reproduce successfully? We are going to look at different reproductive strategies, and we're going to unpack some concepts around how fertilization occurs, etc. Let's get into that in a little while. So it's important that we understand the diversity of reproductive strategies. Now, what is it that we mean by when we refer to reproductive strategies? Now, it's important that we recognize that reproduction, as I said, is a fundamental aspect of all living organisms. The ability to be able to reproduce ensures that the species survives. And many different species have different strategies that allow them to reproduce successfully. Essentially, it's important for us to recognize that not every species reproduces in a similar way, meaning that there are different methods of reproduction that increases their chances of the young surviving, growing up, and producing more offspring. So let's unpack these reproductive strategies. So as I mentioned, reproduction is a characteristic of all organisms. And this ensures that they continue the existence of their species. It is essential to be able to reproduce successfully. Animals use a variety of different reproductive strategies to increase their reproductive success in different environments. Reproductive strategies are structural, functional, and behavior adaptations that increase the chances of fertilization and the survival of the offspring. The success of reproductive strategies depends on how a species utilizes energy to produce and to care for the offspring. So it's important that we understand that reproduction has several levels to it. The amount of energy spent on the physical process is one aspect that we consider. Another aspect is the amount of energy that is spent on raising the young. So let's consider all of those factors when we consider the fact that reproduction is a complex living process. It's important that we understand that there are two types of reproductive strategies, broadly speaking. These are referred to as the R strategy and the K strategy. What is it that these strategies talk to? Essentially, these are different strategies that essentially play out or display the chances of individuals surviving from the time they are born till the time they reach adulthood. And so we know that some species have a high survival rate. Others have a low survival rate. So how is it possible that a species of organisms where their reproductive strategies are not as advanced as a developed species still is able to survive and produce offsprings. Let's look at that by unpacking these two strategies. So we refer to one strategy as the R strategy and the other as the K strategy. In this graph, what I've illustrated is a graph indicating the percentage of maximum lifespan. So this is time of birth, and this is possibly a percentage of their maximum lifespan. And on the y-axis, we essentially have a chance or percentage chance of them surviving from birth. So here we know that when individuals are born or hatched, they have a high percentage chance of survival once they come onto existence. However, that varies through time. And so this graph shows you two distinct strategies, the K strategy or the K selection and the R selection or the R strategy. And what happens if we look at the K strategy, we see that from the time of birth, the chances of survival are extremely high 
and that gradually decreases as the organism reaches its maximum lifespan. So we say that here is a very successful strategy that ensures that many of the offspring survive their initial phase of birth. They reach their maximum lifespan where they probably now uh, age and die. However, if we look at the blue line, which indicates the R selection or the R strategy, it shows that from the time of birth, there is a rapid or there's a drastic decrease in their chances of survival with a few surviving and actually reaching their maximum life uh, expectancy. The graph that's indicated type 2 in the middle shows you a proportionate decrease in their chances of survival from the time of birth. Let's look at examples of these in a while. So an art strategy specialist or selection in species they spend much of their energy on producing many offsprings, but they spend little time or energy on caring for the offspring. So if we look at this graph, we can see that there's a lot of offs the number of young that are produced are exponentially high. There's very little parental care, and hence there's a drastic decrease in the, in the survival of the young. Most of the offspring die before adulthood, and we notice that most of them die before even reaching 50% of their lifespan, but sufficient numbers survive to continue their species. And this essentially ensures that the species survives. So to compensate for a lack of parental care, they produce large number of offspring. And so the idea is that some of them will survive and ensure that the species can continue. When we look at the case strategy, we can look at some animals that produce fewer offsprings, they have expended large amounts of energy on parental care. It means that the offsprings have a better chance of surviving to become adults. And we see that amongst many mammals and us as humans. So when we're born, there's a lot of parental care that is offered in terms of nurturing and developing most mammals. And so they produce fewer offspring. And that successful parental care ensures that the species survives. In this illustration, we're looking at a comparison between the R strategy on the one extreme and the K strategy on the other extreme. And if we look at these, we can see here we have oysters that are being compared to some of our larger primates. What we notice is that oysters spend a lot of energy on producing millions of eggs. And these eggs are around, uh, what's that? 500 million a year that are produced. However, it's important that we recognize that there's no parental care and very few of them survive. If we compare that to the other end of the spectrum, you'll find that some of our larger cats and larger primates produce two offsprings a year or in terms of humans or larger mammals, sometimes even one or two offsprings every five years. There's a degree of parental care that involves in raising the young. And that means that in order for the species to survive, they rather care for the young and provide large amount, amounts of energy and care for them. As we wrap this section up, it's important that we compare the R and K strategies as reproductive strategy mechanisms. Firstly, let's look at the offsprings per brood in terms of the number that are produced. In an R strategy, we have many offsprings that are produced, whereas in the K strategy, we have fewer. And this has got to do with the level or the degree of parental care. Because there are many offsprings produced, the parents do not have the energy to care, so the energy for parental care is much less. If we compare that to the K strategy, the K strategy individuals show larger amounts of parental care, and this ensures greater success in survival of the young. The mortality refers to the death rate in the R strategy is high, and that's because of a lack of parental care. If we compare that to mammals and other organisms that show high amounts of parental care, there are few individuals that are born that actually die, and that's got linked to the parental care in nurturing, in feeding the young. We also notice that the R strategy species generally have smaller offsprings, their body size 
is much smaller. If we compare that to your case strategies, they have larger body sizes and they're capable of surviving independently. If we look at the onset of maturity, in our strategy species, they generally have an early age at which they mature. However, case strategy individuals tend to mature much later, and that's linked to their proper development until they reach sexual maturity. Reproduction is often once in their lifetime. When we compare that to case strategies, they produce multiple times in their lifespan. And that's because the process of reproduction in, case, in our strategies requires a lot of energy. And so often this happens only once in their lifetime. Generally, your R strategy species live in very unstable environments, whereas your K strategies tend to occupy stable environments, and that's important in their greater survival chance. The type of species that these are generally ones that are the pioneer species, right at the bottom of the trophic level, if we compare them to the K strategies, these are generally your secondary, tertiary, and much more climax species that have established in an environment. The population sizes may vary, and that's what is unique about an R strategy. There may be times in the year that their populations rapidly change because of effects in the environment. However, the K strategy populations tend to remain stable throughout their existence. So guys, that's a wrap for this section. We've spent some time looking at a comparison between the K strategy and the R strategy. Let's have a short break, freshen up, relax a bit, and then we'll continue with the rest of this lesson. See you in a bit. Welcome back, life science learners from the ad. I trust that you guys are refreshed. Let's continue with our lesson. As a recap of what we've been doing, we've been looking at reproduction in vertebrates. Now it's important that we understand the way forward. We've looked at the reproductive strategies early on. Now we've got to look at the types of reproductive strategies that are displayed by different species. Now there are various different types that we need to look at. Most species have different approaches to various aspects of reproduction, such as how to attract a suitable mate, and that's important in terms of attracting the most favorable mating partner. And we see this displayed in the form of courtship behavior, where individuals will display feathers, they'll call out. So let's unpack that in a while. We also know that fertilization is important. Where it occurs and how it occurs also influences the success of reproduction. Where the embryo develops is key. We'll look at the position and the development of the embryo, how developed the young need to be when they're born or hatched. And we'll refer to that in terms of how the young are either dependent on the parents or can survive soon after hatching or being born by themselves independently. And will the young need to be protected or fed are crucial aspects to understanding the different successes to reproducing successfully. Now, let's unpack what fertilization is. We've looked at fertilization in the past, and we know that fertilization is a process where there's a fusion between the gametes produced by different individuals or the mating individuals. Let's look at how this influences the success of reproduction. It's important that we recognize that for as we talk about fertilization, there are two types of fertilizations that can be exhibited by vertebrates. We have external fertilization and internal fertilization. What does this mean? If we go back to fertilization, it's important that we recognize that fertilization is the fusion. If it happens within the body, we refer to that as internal. If it happens externally, it's a different mechanism where the gametes rely on the external factors to bring them together. Courtship behavior. It's important that we recognize that courtship is the ability of species to be able to display some form of behavior that attracts the most favorable offspring. And so the word courting that we refer to is essentially getting to know someone. And so it's important that courtship in animals results in mating and eventually reproduction. Courtship may be simple, involving 
a small number of chemicals, sometimes visual stimuli or even auditory stimuli, meaning sounds. Or it may be very complex, involving a series of acts by two or more individuals using several modes of communication. So we find that courtship might be a very simple method of attracting mates, or it can be very complex, depending on the social organization of the species. Courtship behavior essentially signals to the mating partners to attract another animal for mating and reproduction. Very few amphibians and reptile species display any courtship behaviors. And if we see that courtship becomes significantly more extensive and elaborate as we see complexity of species developing. So in your high, higher order vertebrates, we find that courtship is a significant part of reproduction. Birds and mammals often have elaborate courtship behaviors and they displays which often attracts the most favorable mates. Strategies that happen during courtship could include the release of chemicals or hormones, and we refer to them as pheromones. It could also involve visual display. As such, brightly colored body parts are displayed, or even auditory. So if we look at the peacock, the peacock obviously has an elaborate dance that it does, and this is to attract the females. If we think of frogs and how they croak, if we think of birds and the sounds that they make, those are all parts of stimulation that they use to attract the most favorable mate. And why is this important? Generally, in natural selection, we know that those individuals that have the sweetest cries, the sweetest voices, or the most elaborate display of feathers are the ones that are going to be most attractive. And hence, we see that even in the uh, success strategies of these individuals. If we go back to fertilization, it occurs outside the female's body, and when it does, we say that it's external. Here we look at the release of eggs and sperm from the male and the female fish. This process is called spawning, and spawning is a process where the sperms and eggs are released externally, and it depends on the current and the environment in which this occurs. We'll find that in order for this to occur, there must be a large number of gametes produced because those eggs and sperms that are released depend on the environment in which they are to move and to come together and successfully fertilize. So let's try and understand this, that external fertilization mainly occurs in fish and amphibians that are aquatic, essentially living in water. There is very little cooperative behavior that is required between the male and the females. There's often some degree of courtship indicating readiness to mate, but it doesn't get very elaborate. We find that there's courtship in specific mating behaviors ensure that the eggs and the sperm are released at the same time and placed to increase the chances of fertilization occurring. Often there are pheromones that are released and sometimes these pheromones act as chemical stimuli to announce to the other mating partner that the process of reproduction should be timed and that eggs and sperms are released at the same time. We also know that there are a large number of gametes that are produced, and this is produced so that it increases the chance of fertilization occurring. Because it's external, and due to the subject of environmental factors affecting them, the chances of fertilization occurring needs to be enhanced by producing a large number of eggs and sperms. So this is quite an energy intensive process. You often see that the ova secretes specific chemicals to attract the sperm, and that process is called chemotaxis, where the sperm move towards the eggs as a result of chemical attraction, which are chemicals produced by the egg or the ova. And we see these are subtle mechanisms that increase the chances of fertilization occurring. We know that the fertilized egg cells or the zygote develops into the larva that lives on the yolk and plankton in aquatic organisms. The parents do not need to expand any energy to feed the young. So the young actually develop independently with reserve energy in the yolk. So there's very little parental care, if at all. However, the environmental dangers such as 
predators, reduce the probability of the offspring surviving and reaching adulthood. And that is essentially one of the risks involved with external fertilization. We know that internal fertilization is a much more successful technique to ensure fertilization. This occurs inside the female's body and it does not require water. So because there's the introduction of the sperm into the female reproductive body, you find that it's not dependent on water. However, we'll need what we call an organ. And that organ is often referred to as the penis that is important in introducing the, the sperm into the reproductive tract. So internal fertilization comes with its own set of challenges. You'll find that for fertilization to occur, there has to be specific mating strategies and there must be cooperative behavior between the female and the male individuals. And so much fewer offsprings are produced. However, the success of external fertilization is significantly less when compared to internal fertilization. Cool. We've got to discuss the development of the egg. And this occurs either internally, externally, or internally as well with no dependence on the mother. So there are three strategies that we look at. Oviparous, ovoviviparous, and viviparous. So when we look at ovipary, we look at organisms that develop where the eggs are outside the female's body and these eggs hatch outside with no dependence on the mother. So the egg has its yolk and that egg develops externally with dependence on the young from the yolk in there. We notice that fertilization usually takes place externally. The developing embryo is surrounded by a jelly-like layer and here's, if we look at these are frog eggs that are released. And so these are developing outside. There's a large number of gametes that are produced which require lots of energy. The eggs with the yolk are produced which require little energy and hence the young develop independently. Here we see examples of animals that are producing eggs externally and they actually have lots of energy in these eggs which are sufficient for the embryo to develop independently in. It's important that we understand that the amniotic egg is a significant structural adaptation for surviving outside the body. Fish and amphibians need water for fertilization. You'll find that your terrestrial animals, such as your birds and your mammals, require specialized structures to protect the developing egg from drying out. And hence we have seen that organisms that live terrestrially have succeeded in reproducing due to the development of an amniotic egg. And essentially an amniotic egg is an egg that has these different structures that allow them to be able to survive and grow independently outside the body. So we see the presence of a yolk sac, and that yolk sac is the energy that is required for the developing young. These eggs often have an external covering, which is a shell that could be a hard shell or a soft leathery shell, and that shell prevents the desiccation or the dehydration of the egg. We also know that there are several layers that are important in the development of the embryo. The amniotic fluid ensures that the young remains hydrated within the egg. So having looked at the structure, we, we know that the development of an embryo is relying on the amniotic egg as a successful strategy for animals that show external fertilization or internal fertilization where the eggs develop outside the body. As we wrap this up, we, it's important that we recognize that the yolk is important in the development and the independent structures outside the body, which increase their chances of survival. Guys, you've been a wonderful audience. We've looked at reproductive strategies in this segment. Let's have a short break and I'll see you back in a little while.
Welcome back life science learners. We're going to continue with our lesson on reproduction and reproductive strategies in vertebrates. As we get into the lesson, let's recognize what we need to get into. What we're looking at in this segment is the success of reproduction based on parental care. And we're going to kind of overview the structure of the amniotic egg and its significance in reproductive success. So what is parental care? Are the young protected or fed? So parental care is essentially the care offered by the parents. Is this only nurturing or does this refer to this, the protection of the eggs or even a time in which the egg develops internally or the embryo and fetus develop internally? So let's try and unpack what parental care is. Parental care is the behavior patterns where the parents spend time or energy on feeding and protecting the offspring. In animals where most of the energy input of the parents is prenatal, essentially during the initial stages of development internally or of the egg, we find that there is usually very little or no postnatal parental care. So in individuals or species where there's a lot of parental care for the young developing before they are born, you'll find that the young develop successfully and the parents spend very little energy on caring for them post-hatching or post-development. So in animals where the parental care energy is less, postnatal parental care is intensive, requiring much more energy. So essentially, in species where you find that there's very little care prenatally, so there's very little development and incubation or development of the young during the development of the egg, you'll find that once they hatch or born, there's significant care for them post that. So we say that there's higher parental care if there is very little prenatal care. Right, examples of parental care include the following. Guarding of the eggs, the incubation of the eggs, keeping of the young warm, we see this in birds, feeding of the young, we see this in many mammals, the protection from predators, especially amongst your herbivores. We find that the young are often protected by their parents. And so this links to different types of parental care. Most fish display little to no parental care. And you'll find that after fertilization, the eggs are abandoned and the young have to survive on their own. Some fish, however, do show parental care. An example of that are some fish that are mouth brooding. So here you see that the young are developing inside the brooding pouch, which is the mouth of these fish. And so there are exceptions to the rules. And this is one example where the parents produce the eggs, they fertilized, and the mother holds these eggs in their mouth until the young hatch and are cared for. We also see that amphibians show little parental care. Parental care that involves only guarding the eggs and protecting them during their initial development is seen among some amphibians. Most reptiles display no parental care. Reptiles are terrestrial animals and they lay the eggs that are hatched and they heat up in the sun. So these eggs hatch independently and they develop autonomously with no specific intervention from their parents. However, we also see examples of exceptions to this. Crocodiles, however, guard their eggs and protect the young after hatching. Some lizards and snakes also guard their eggs. So we do see exceptions to the general rule. And so essentially these are strategies that ensures that these species or animals survive. So here are the crocodile, here's an image of a crocodile and you can see that it obviously has caught its prey and it brings it back and the young are going to feed off that. And that's part of the extended parental care that we see in these reptiles. Birds display a great degree of parental care. The parents build nest in which the eggs are laid. And this is obviously a period in which the eggs will undergo incubation. The nest helps to protect the eggs against predators as well as when they are born and hatched. You find that often the nestlings rest in their nest, safe from other predators. Eggs are incubated through the body heat of the parents. And in most birds, it is the female that incubates the eggs. And so this is a significant amount of parental care that we see. We also know that 
Birds often feed the young. So when the youngs hatch, you'll find that the parents go out, collect food, and that food is brought back. So feeding of the young is also part of parental care. We know that mammals, amongst all of the species, degree, often display the highest degree of parental care. Most mammals are totally helpless after birth and completely depend on parental care. And we see that. Many mammals are born where they cannot survive independently and they rely on their parents firstly for feeding and second for protection. And you'll find that after birth the young receive milk from the mothers through the mammary glands and that is distinctive of your mammals. We also know that the young are kept warm by the body heat of the parents helping them to regulate their body temperatures. And often the young do not have full body coverings of either fur or hair. And that means that they find it difficult to regulate their body temperatures. The parents often teach the young behavioral patterns so that the young can function independently. Example, how and where to find food. And we see this amongst our predators, where the wild dogs or even leopards and lions teach their young on how to hunt and to survive independently. And this is part of an instinctive behavior that is seen as part of parental care. Okay, we know that mammals show extensive parental care and that parental care includes from the young of feeding them to the time in, in terms of nurturing them and skilling them up with the necessary skills of being able to access food, hunt, as well as protect themselves in terms of danger from predators. So if we were to compare parental care it is a significant strategy amongst all species with different degrees depending on the complexity of their organization, with mammals showing the highest degree of parental care. And as we think about it, we often know that our parents care for us unconditionally. No matter how old we are, we often treat it as babies. And that's part of our instinctive makeup of, as us humans. So parental care is an integral part of us developing and growing. So guys, as we wrap this segment up, we've just looked at parental care as a significant reproductive strategy. I think you guys have been good, attentive, you deserve a bit of care, self-care. Go and here, rehydrate, drink some water, and I'll see you back in a little break. Welcome back Life Science Learners to our final segment. In this segment, we're going to look at the development of precocial and altricial strategies as part of reproduction in vertebrates. Let's try and understand what do we mean by precocial and altricial development. When we look at this, we refer to essentially the development before birth or hatching. So the amount of development that occurs either before, pre or after birth is essentially what we're looking at. And that's significant in trying to understand the survival of a species. And so these techniques or these strategies allow offer different successes in terms of species or animals surviving. So precocial and attritial are terms that describe the extent of development of the embryo when it is hatched or born. So these two development strategies occur mainly in birds, and mammals and are related to the environment. So depending on the environment in which they survive, the degree of development either before birth or after birth is significant in terms of their survival in their environment. And this relates to the amount of food available, so the food supply to the developing embryo and offspring, as well as the protection against predators. And so we'll find that this often determines the success of animals in terms of the danger that they may face post hatching or being born. And so let's try and unpack this behavior in terms of a strategy for increasing their chances of surviving. Right, so let's unpack precocial development. So precocial development refers to species where the young are fully developed and immediately mobile when they are hatched or born. So generally we find that the young, once they hatch, 
are able to, after a little while, stand up, run, or even be able to respond by themselves. And this links to a lot of the development that happens during the development of the young internally or in the egg. So generally, fewer offsprings are produced when we refer to precocial development as individuals has to develop relatively advanced stages before being born or hatched. So we find that in precocial development, because of the extent of development that is within the parent internally or in the egg, there are generally fewer offsprings that are produced because they require lots of energy during their development or even those eggs that are produced have a lot of energy and require fewer eggs to be able to sustain the development of the young in their, in their, in their eggs. In precocial animals, most of the energy is expended on parental development, oh, sorry, prenatal development. Essentially, prenatal development is the development before being born or hatched. You'll find that the mothers are far less involved after the young are born or hatched. So essentially, we find that in precocial development, there's a lot of development that happens prenatally. Essentially, when the young are developing inside the uterus of the mother or inside the egg, they develop fully to a point that when they are born, they are capable of surviving often independently by themselves. So we find that the parents offer very little parental care post-development. So lots of prenatal energy required, but postnatal energy is very little energy from the parents. So this is a display in birds on the ground, such as your chickens, ducks, geese, guinea fowls, and your ostriches. So you'll find that often birds that lay eggs terrestrially on the ground have an extensive period of the egg developing within the, the embryo developing within the egg. And that means that when these hatch, you'll find that the, hatch, the hatchlings are able to survive. So the incubation time is usually long so that the young can develop completely before being hatched. These eggs have to contain large amounts of yolk and albumin, which is a, which is a suitable and sufficient food reserve for an extended incubation period. Once they hatch, you'll find that the chick eggs' are, eyes are often open directly after hatching. So you'll find that an extensive incubation period occurs, the significant development, the significant development of hair or fur or feathers rather. And these, when they hatch, their eyes open quite soon after and they're able to respond and actually survive immediately without having parental care. Right, so you'll find that the chicken's bodies are covered with downy feathers, and these are the feathers that keep them warm, and soon after development, these feathers are replaced by adult feathers. Many chicks, however, cannot regulate their own temperature, and they rely on their parents' body heat. So you'll find that often the parents will be around them to offer some amount of parental care in terms of heat that allows the chicks to develop. The chicks are immediately active, and leave the nest soon after hatching. The chicks can often, with the help of the parents, find food on their own. And that's an important part of many of our terrestrial uh, birds that lay the eggs on the, on, the, on the ground, is that the chicks can attempt to survive by themselves. The chicks attempt to protect themselves by either uh, lying low or camouflage or remaining motionless on the ground, and in this way, they're able to survive from predators. One of the challenges of being um, kind of hatching on the ground is that these eggs are exposed to predators. So soon after hatching, these chicks are instinctively uh, pick up the behavior of being able to respond to threats. And their threat is either moving into an area that camouflages them, or lying motionless or flat on the ground so that they are not seen uh, or as probable prey by the predators. So if we continue with precocial development in mammals, there are mammals that display this as well. These are seen in most ungulates, and these are your hooved animals, such as sheep, antelope, giraffes, zebra, wildebeest, rhinos, and the hippos as well. And you'll find that these mammals show a 
gest gestation period or the development of the young being sufficiently long and this allows for enough time for the young to develop fully and reach development completely within the uterus. The embryo or the fetus receives nutrients uh, from the placenta during the gestational period. The eyes of the young open directly after birth and the young are covered in hair. So you find that in mammals there's an extensive incubation period. The young develop maximum in terms of their body covering and skin and the ability to survive once born. And so soon after they are born, you'll find that their body is covered and they have a significant uh, independence when compared to other species. So the young are immediately active. They can stand and start walking within a few hours of birth. And this is often a strategy in your hooved animals to be able to avoid predation. So one of the challenges in the environments that they face is that predators are constantly looking for young, weak individuals. So being able to survive, being able to move immediately after being born is a successful strategy in terms of survival. We also find that the young can feed themselves and drink milk from the mother. The young can attempt to protect themselves by either doing the same as what birds do. So remaining camouflaged, they can lie flat or motionless or they basically run away from their predators because they're able to live actively soon after being born. Okay, and so here is a, is a beautiful image of giraffes and their little calves that actually are capable of moving and being mobile and independent soon after being born. Okay, let's move on to altricial development and focus on the word al meaning after and I often refer to this where the species uh, in the species where the young are not fully developed and cannot move around immediately after being born or hatched. So there's a lot of development that happens after they are born. So they're born often with very limited movement or the ability to survive independently. And so lots of their development happens postnatal. So let's try and unpack that. So in general, these more offsprings are produced and you'll find that the young are born or hatched at an early stage. Altricial animals spend most of the energy on postnatal development, so after birth. The parents are involved in feeding the young and protecting them against predators for a long time after birth. If we compare these to our precocial development in birds, you'll find that in birds that are altricial, these birds are nesting above the ground. When we compare that to precocial, these were birds that were nesting on the ground. So we find that these are examples of the doves, the weaver birds, your eagles, as well as, as well as your falcons. So these perch high up in trees, away from predators, because when these young hatch, they spend extensive periods of time in their nest, depending on their parents to bring them food. And so as a young developing chick, they, they, their safety depends on being isolated in an area where predators cannot easily access them. So you'll find that the incubation periods are much shorter when we compare that to your uh, precocial birds. You'll find that they also spend lots of their time in their nest developing after hatching. And this is to provide protection against predators. The young hatch as soon as possible and they don't have that extensive period of development in the egg. The eggs are smaller than those of the precocial species and they contain little yolk. So if we compare that ostrich egg, significantly large, lots of energy in it. And so you'll find that the egg in the ostrich, the young embryo develops as fully possible so that when they hatch, they are able to survive and immediately be active. However, if we compare that to birds like a dove egg, relatively small, and that means that the dove or the weavers uh, or even your falcons and your eagles, those eggs require lots of support once the young develop. And so that development happens after they are hatched. Okay, so you'll find that in altricial development, the chick's eyes are often still closed after hatching. The chicks have naked bodies without any down feathers on them. So that you'll find that their bodies haven't developed fully in the eggs, so their eyes are still closed, uh, their bodies are exposed, and so it means that they often require their parents to be able to keep them warm. 
So the chicks cannot regulate their body temperature and are still dependent on their parents' body heat. You'll find that the chicks cannot walk very far or even fly, and so they are bound to that nest during the initial few days or weeks after development. And so the chicks remain in their nest for a long period of time and are totally dependent on their parents for food. And here's an, a classic image of the young. You'll find that the eyes are closed, you find that the body has no covering, and so they have exposed body surfaces. The eyes, they, have, they rely on their parents. The nest often is provided with feathers or, or, or structures that allow them to stay warm and to stay hydrated and fed. So if we compare these strat strategies amongst different species, we'll find that precocial development and altricial development are two strategies that allow for successful development, each having their own sets of challenges in terms of the young surviving. However, we need to recognize that at the end, every species that exists today is successful because of their own unique reproductive strategies. So if you were to ask me, you know, would the birds that live on the ground have been more successful if they had changed from, an from a precocial to an altricial? The answer would be actually no, because each species has adapted to their unique strategies in terms of increasing their chances of survival. So reproductive strategies are unique to each species, and we've looked at animals today and we've compared them and how they success successfully survive using each of the unique reproductive strategies, from parental care to the development of the young within the egg in terms of the structure of the egg, to, in fact, the, the nurturing of parental care post the development of the young. Guys, you've been a great audience. As we wrap this section up, I wish you well. See you soon. Take care and have a bio day.